Good afternoon to everybody. It is a great pleasure to have here Massimo Fonazier. He's a professor to the University of Munich, the Technical University, Department of Mathematics. He is a coordinator of Munich Data Center, which is a big uh, project. And uh, he won uh, in 2012 an ERC starting grant. And uh, he's the author of um, a lot of a long list of papers starting from uh, wavelet signal analysis, uh, dynamical system, and machine learning. And, and more important, sorry, more important, it is a good friend of Malga. Thank you to be here. Okay. The title is there, so okay. it is not necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes? Right? Okay. Wonderful. So, thank you very much, Ernesto, for inviting me here. And uh, so, um, I was um, uh, thinking today to uh, give you a short, sort of overview um, of some of, uh, results, uh, some of the results that we had in the last few years um, within my group. Um, they are uh, actually results that um, uh, came after my, my ERC grants, so it's not about my ERC grants, it's something else. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's about three, three tales of, um, mathematical tales of machine learning. And so I go right away on, 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 on them, and, and, and uh, starting with the first, which is uh, a sort of constructive information theory type of results related to uh, identification of uh, feed-forward neural networks. So this is the first tale. Um, they, in this tale, uh, eventually the identification or the reconstruction of a network um, will, uh, will be solved by, by uh, a suitable non-convex optimization over the sphere. And this will introduce us to the second tale which is about the global optimization of non-necessarily convex functions, but non-convex functions over manifolds with uh, global guarantees uh, of convergence, which is uh, an important topic in general in machine learning and uh, uh, with an, an example already in the uh, problem of neural networks. And then uh, the last topic will be about uh, bringing some of the tools that I developed in the, in the ERC grant uh, project that was about optimal control um, and uh, uh, somehow bringing some of these tools within uh, the framework of training neural networks and explaining somehow the training of neural networks as a sort of mean field optimal control problem. So this will be the third tale of the story today. Okay, let's start with uh, deep neural networks and uh, somehow I give a brief introduction uh, uh, to the topic because I mean uh, there might be people that may not be familiar with that. And so deep neural networks are nothing else than uh, a finite uh, step iterative algorithms that are parametric. So you have an iterative algorithm that does n steps, n iterations but it's, it's parametric. Mm? And what you do, you simply try to fit the parameters of this algorithm so that given certain inputs, you get certain outputs. That's what you do, okay? If you want, from a computer science point of view, it's like having a generic software uh, that does a certain type of operations like loops, or if operations, like if, then, else operations, assignments and stuff like that. But you, 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 you don't, don't have it already. Somehow you, you want to find the software that given certain inputs give you certain outputs. But of course, trying to fit software, so certain kind of operations of a software to a certain input and output is complicated. But if you can mathematize it, uh, 
by intertwining linear operations with nonlinear operations that uh, represent switches, like if then else, right? Then all of a sudden you can you can write software that uh, is optimized, right? So that's a bit the idea of uh, neural networks. And by now they are able to perform state-of-the-art um, results in many tasks like image uh, recognition, speech, speech recognition, language translation, and um, so also we have uh, deep learning methods that uh, are able to play games and beat humans, uh, masters on that. And uh, so how does it work? Well, as, as I said, you can try to um, create a, a sort of parametric software and the minimal unit of a parametric software is uh, uh, inspired by biology and in particular it's a way to describe a neuron and the way you describe the neuron is uh, by simply considering intertwining a linear operation that is typically a scalar product of the input with respect to a given weight w and uh, post uh, operating this by using a, a scalar nonlinearity uh, that might be shifted by a certain uh, scalar tau. And uh, these are called weights, these are called biases. Uh, the function g is typically called activation function. And these kind of simple functions that you write here are the, probably one of the simplest possible functions you can write in. Uh, in uh, multivariate settings. So these functions um, may be defined in very high dimension, okay, on a domain that has a very high dimension, but they are very, very, very simple, right? These functions are having a special directionality called the ridge, and they are called also ridge functions, right? So these are kind of functions of this kind, where there is a certain direction and they are constant in the orthogonal direction to, the, to that direction, okay? And so if you choose a activation function that looks like a heaviside type of function, or it has a sort of step-like shape, then you can, by using this kind of function, create a sort of tessellation of the space. You can, uh, in a certain sense, create a, separatri a separatrix between uh, sub up, uh, half spaces, right? And if you do linear combinations of such functions, what you, what you create is really um, partitioning of the space, creating a sort of piecewise uh, constant functions of partition of the space, and should not be that uh, surprising then that you can approximate any, any continuous function by using such linear combinations, okay? So this is uh, called also universal, universal theorem uh, of approximation in, uh, in neural networks that you can approximate with such things, um, typical continuous functions over compact sets. Deep neural networks are nothing else concatenations or, or if you want compositions of layers of neurons uh, which means that you take matrices representing uh, multiple weights that are applied to inputs and to the corresponding vector output you apply component wise you apply component wise the uh, shifted activation functions and to the result which is a new vector you give it somehow as a uh, input to the next layer and you iterate um, in after a finite number of steps you have the output Okay, so a neural network is nothing else than an iterative algorithm with the final number of iterations that are param parametric and the parameters of all the networks are precisely the weights and the shifts while somehow usually the activation functions are typically chosen a priori. Okay, so again, so the depth, the number of steps is usually determined uh, on the basis of heuristics and also the shape of the activation function. Um, the, the number of neurons per layer, which is the size of these matrices, uh, the dimensions of these matrices are also typically uh, decided uh, heuristically. Instead, somehow the weights, the parameters, the weights and the shifts are tuned, are fit to the task 
by, um, in a certain sense, optimizing the parameter in order to be able to give you a certain, cert given certain inputs, obtaining certain outputs. Okay, there is a new trend called Auto ML, which is also optimizing over the architecture of the network, over the number of layers, of uh, number of neurons, and uh, the activation functions, and uh, it can be made automatic as well. So now the computer scientists are trying to to remove computer scientists from machine learning completely because what the computer scientists have been doing so far was optimizing basically by hands uh, some of these parts. But anyway, uh, so how do you fit the network? How do you compute uh, some of the weights? Typically, you try to minimize a cost function or given tr a training data so you have certain images of of animals, X is I, and certain labels like dogs and cats, and you try to have multiple images that are labeled, and then somehow what you do, you try to have a network that given a certain image is able to give you the right, the, the right label, and to do that, you optimize the parameters W and tau such that this empirical risk is minimized, okay? That's what is going on. The empirical risk can be uh, built in many ways. This is a, a mean square error, but you can use a, uh, somehow a relative entropy or any other kind of distance, like a Wasserstein distance uh, or some other discrepancies that you want to use. Now, <clears throat> interestingly enough, if the number of training data is of the same uh, complexity than the network, where the complexity of the network is basically uh, given by the number of parameters of the network, okay? So, uh, so this is the number of parameters of the network, and you have a number of training data that scales more or less like the number of parameters of the free parameters of the network, then there are some results that says that such data will be interpolated by some network. So there are, there are parameters such that the network will be able exactly to fit this data. But if you fit the data, it means that you can make this distance equal to zero, and therefore what you obtain is the so-called zero loss. Okay. So in other words, this is the so-called realizable regime where basically data will be most likely realizable by a network. Okay? In this situation, what happens is that uh, the, the, there is a zero loss, so there will be parameters that are zero, and uh, on top of that, there might be multiple parameters that gives you zero. Why there are multiple? Because if your activation function is, for instance, have some symmetry, it's uh, like an odd function or a symmetric function or stuff like that, then all of a sudden what you can see is that by changing signs uh, in a suitable way, you can reproduce the same function, and which means that not only uh, certain kind of parameters will be valid, parameters to give you zero loss, but also the opposite of those parameters would do the same. And so there are some natural symmetries also changing the order of the neurons will give you uh, also other parameters that are maybe ordered in different ways. And so all of a sudden you have multiple, multiple optimizers. Question is, and this is one of the questions that I will try to, uh, to investigate later, whether up to symmetries indeed in the realizable regime, there is only one network that can do the game, up to symmetries, okay? This is one question that we will try to understand. What we know is that in the over-parameterized regime, so where the network has way more parameters than the samples, then certainly there will be zero loss uh, type of uh, uh, situation, but the, the number of minimizers will be larger. There will be more minimizers, that more networks that fit the data, okay? And this is the typical situation that is currently, um, currently addressed in the, uh, in the literature. 
because, um, because um, somehow it is, there is evidence that increasing the parameters of the network makes the landscape of this loss function um, increasingly less non-convex, okay? To the point that whenever you have networks that contain a very large amount of neurons, somehow this loss becomes quite nicely, quite nicely um, convex, and you can kind of isolate the global uh, maximizer so that simple uh, opt optimizers like gradient descent are really able to reach uh, some of these global minimizers, okay? And here, there is some evidence is that sub-optimizers -op in the over-parameterized regime tend to select some of these uh, global optimizers that do have lower complexity. That is called uh, implicit bias of these kind of optimizers, okay? So this is a bit of, about somehow the realizable, realizable regime, the over-parameterized regime, the uh, results that we know about this training phase, and so on. So um, let's stay now on the realizable regime. And in the realizable regime, so not in the known, uh, non, the over-parameterized regime, uh, uh, makes this uh, landscape quite nice, but in the realizable regime that is not over-parameterized, the loss might be a little bit more complicated with more non-convexity appearing. But nevertheless, um, it would be interesting to know whether the networks that, that perform the interpolation are actually unique up to symmetries. We learned that symmetries will certainly allow you to have multiple networks by permuting uh, neurons or by changing the signs of, of weights, but are these all, all the changes that you need, need to do, right? So that's the question. So is there one network only that somehow um, fit uh, this data? And uh, it would be also nice to know whether there is some robustness. So if I move the data a little bit, am I moving these, uh, somehow these uh, unique uh, parameters uh, a little bit as well? So with a controlled perturbation, okay? So whether we have some stability in a certain sense of the, of the data. And so these are the questions that we would like to understand in the realizable regime. It's already something very interesting to, to know. And, uh, and this brings us to, uh, to the problem of unique identifiability of networks, which is a quite long uh, story problem started already in the 90s with uh, results of uh, several people culminating with uh, some work done by Charles Pfefferman in 1994. And the result of Pfefferman says that a generic fully connected deep neural network with activation function given by the hyperbolic tangent is uniquely identified by its, up to, uh, by its out output up to symmetries. So there is only one network that gives you the, those out output, okay? Uh, up to symmetries means that up to permutation and change of signs and stuff like that. You with me? This is a remarkable result, and it is based on the following principle. So meromorphic functions, they, they do have a countable number of zeros, and the hyperbolic tangent is one of them. And on top of that, somehow these uh, poles that this uh, function have are hyperiodic, so they, they repeat themselves in the in the, along the i axis. But what you do is basically you are summing and composing dilated and shifted version of the hyperbolic tangent. That's what is a deep network. And what does it mean? It means that you are simply, um, in a certain sense, dilating or, or somehow twisting in certain directions these poles. And the way they are oriented now, and of course composing um, that just 
compose in a certain sense the poles because uh, something that is smooth is passed to something that is uh, uh, singular. And so basically um, what you create is simply a further countable number of poles, but they are distributed and geometrically distributed in a way that is tremendously uh, uh, related to the weights of the network, right? So basically the position of these poles says everything about the weights, okay? It's a way to encode geometrically the structure and the weights of the network. The last, the way uh, somehow the result is obtained is by proving that there is a sort of analytic continuation so that if two networks coincide, coincide on the Euclidean plane, they need to have a, the same analytic extension, which means that they need to have the same poles, but if they have the same poles, means that they have the same weights because the poles encode exactly geometrically where the weights, okay? That's the architecture of the proof of Charles Pfefferman, okay? Now, the result has been uh, generalized recently by Vlacic and Bolsky uh, to non-fully connected networks with more general activation functions, okay? But this is one of the results known that have two problems. <laughs> the first problem is that uh, it is based on having the output of the network in, in its, uh, um, in its uh, full glory. So you need to know, know completely the network of the, of the, um, of the, uh, of the, uh, the output of the network. In particular, you have to have a, a, a identification of the entire uh, Euclidean space, right? So you need to have every information. The second is that there is no stability in the story. So it's not discussed what happens if, if you have a perturbation, how this really affects everything, okay? So that's a bit the, the thing. So uh, as you know, networks nevertheless remain determined by a finite number of parameters. So a network is a finite parameter object. It's not an infinite parameter object. And so determining uh, these parameters uh, sounds uh, much easier uh, than uh, identifying a meromorphic function. I mean, it's way more, should be simpler than that, right? And uh, the trouble is that already in the 90s, uh, it has been shown that identifying a neural network is in principle an NP-hard problem. So you need to have a very large amount of samples to really be able to identify the network. Okay, so in principle, um, identifying the network from samples, it's, it's a very difficult problem. However, it's not at all expected that for generic networks, uh, you really need uh, such a very large amount of samples. Um, nevertheless, if you try to use stochastic gradient descent, you take what you call a teacher network, that generate your data. And then you try to fit a student network to fit this data. And you try to learn the weights of the student network. And we, you hope that by doing so, what you are learning are the weights of the teacher network. Well, as a matter of fact, genetically, this doesn't work. You want to converge to the right network, and you will somehow saturate to a zero, non-zero loss uh, in general. Okay, so there are networks that do have zero loss, but the classical stochastic gradient descent usually is not able to reach them. You with me? We are not in the overparameterized regime where everything is very nicely smooth and relatively. Com, uh, convex so that you really converge to the global minimizer. Here you are in the realizable regime, so the number of parameters basically scales as the number of uh, data. You with me? So the question is, is there a way to learn the right network, okay, in the generic case by using a number of samples that scales with the complexity of the network and not 
with a very large amount of samples. Okay? The answer is yes, as you can see here, and I will, uh, and I will show it uh, to you in a moment. Other questions so far or comments also in the chat or whatever? Okay, so then what I would like to prove is the following meta, the meta theorem and we have multiple versions of it because we started with one neuron. <laughs> how hard is, is to learn one neuron? The second was how hard is to learn one layer neural network? The third was how hard is learning two layer neural networks? And eventually we were, we were kind of understanding how hard is to learn deep neural networks. Now, I don't tell you all the results in the between. I will tell you only the, the very last one. So in how to learn deep networks in its full glory. You with me? Yes? And the meta theorem, so actually if you had to write it in its full glory, it should be very, very long. But uh, it says that somehow generic networks with a certain complexity can be robustly identified, stably identified, um, from a number of samples that scales like on the complexity. Uh, as soon as the network is generic and, um, and the activation function is sufficiently smooth. That's the kind of results that we are going to see. So there are no more networks. There is only one network, okay? And the other request is that the samples that we require are actively chosen. So we have the teacher network. We query the teacher network on certain points that we choose. And on these points, we will be able to train a student network and we will be able from the student network to recover exactly the teacher network um, somehow uh, from the beginning, yeah? So the proof architecture is based on two in a two, uh, two, uh, uh, two level procedure. Um, we learned first the parameters, weights, and uh, shifts uh, in somehow in two steps. Uh, the first is that we use differential information about the network. So we, we differentiate the network in a suitable way. And by that, we, we morally learn the weights of the network. And once we have the weights, we uh, fit somehow the, the remaining parameters, the, which could be signs or scales of, the, of these weights, and the shifts, the biases of the network by using a gradient descent, okay, or a stochastic gradient descent. And if you combine these two steps, you can, you can have the reconstruction of the network. And now we, I, sh I show you how these two steps work, okay? You with me? Okay, so this is uh, somehow a definition of deep neural network. If you want, you can write it as a sort of iterative algorithm, okay? It's nothing else than we already said. I simply spell out what are the weights, which are the columns of these weight matrices, um, and uh, these are somehow, these are the shifts. Um, M1 and ML is the number of neurons that you have per layer. The total number of neurons is M, which is the sum of all the uh, neurons of the layers. And so this is just a bit of notation. These are the kind of uh, networks that you can consider. Somehow you have a network that could be rectangular with a small number of outputs. It could be a network that starts with a small input, then it becomes larger and then becomes uh, thin and then we become larger again. So these are all networks that we can consider in this theory. Okay, you with me? Okay, now comes the, um, somehow the uh, fundamental observation. Let's assume that an oracle, somebody, come and give us certain kind of matrices that are compositions 
of the weights of the original network intertwined with certain kind of diagonal matrices, SL and DK, and certain kind of permutations. Okay? So we are morally composing the weights of the network. The, the only thing that we do, maybe we permute the order and we may multiply them by certain diagonal entries. Okay? You with me? And somebody didn't give us this decomposition, but give us this matrix. Okay? So somebody provide us with these guys. Okay? Now, we call such matrices, such kind of matrices, entangled weights. Because these are the weights of the network that are all kind of messed up together. Okay? That's why we call them entangled. You with me? Filippo, you with me? Yeah. Great. You will see that in a moment. Yes? Well, then, if you have them, and they are generic in the sense they are, so, for instance, full rank, this is one thing, one type of genericity that you would like to have, then, by using them, you can synthesize certain kind of weights and certain new shifts, which are permutations of the original shifts, in a way that the network that has these weights and these shifts is precisely equal to your network up to permuting the last layer. Okay? You, you with me? And so the only problem you have is that you have to get this, what remains out to, to determine are the shifts which are not given to you, these diagonal matrices that are not given to you. But if you had these matrices and you had these uh, shifts, you have the, the network itself. Okay? So if I'm able to generate these kind of matrices, I'm left out with way less parameters to, to fit in the network. I have to fit the, the shifts and these diagonal matrices. And with that, later, we can do it by gradient descent, and this will work. While gradient descent won't be able to fit everything at once, if you pre-compute the entangled weights, and then you fit the remaining parameters, this is going to work. Other questions? Is it clear? Okay. Filippo, you have questions? Ernesto. Exactly. And now the problem is how to get them. You, don't, you want that they have this structure, but you don't need to have this structure. You don't need to know the structure, right? So what you want is that they have this structure. OK? And now I'll show you how you get them. Yeah. yeah. So whenever you have them and you had, this is a, a sort of um, hypothetical thing, the shifts and these SL and DL matrices, then you could synthesize a new network that is actually equal to the original network. You with me? The trouble is that you don't have SL, DL, and tau L. You have everything else. And so these are three parameters that remain to be fit. Questions over there? No question over there? Great. I can ask you a question yep. uh, on YouTube. Why, why do you care about uh, recovering different types of ways when, after all, in machine learning, what you care about is the output of the network, so that you know, you're able to be doing more of this? 
Right. Well, I, well, that's 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 a more theoretical question yeah. from from the very beginning. So, yeah. So, right. So the uh, the question is, why do you want to identify the the weights of a network? While in machine learning, nobody cares about that. What they care is that the network is able to uh, uh, identify the next input correctly. Well, the, uh, the answer are two. Um, the first answer is that what are these weights? How the weights do encode the input and output of the network? Is there a unique way they the input and output is encoded in the weights? Is it a stable encoding? Because eventually you want to interpret the results, right? And if you have a unique um, assignment from inputs and outputs to the weights, that is a very, very strong encoding that tells you that the weights are very, very precisely having uh, some relationship with the input and output. So it becomes in interpretable. This is the first answer. The second answer is that, yes, you have an L2 error guarantee in machine learning. But it tells you nothing about the guarantee that the next data is correctly classified. You know that the least square the generalization error might not be that bad. But this generalization error is an L2 error. It doesn't say anything about the pointwise evaluation, right? So it would be great to have an L infinity error that tells you that given certain input and outputs, the network I got is very close to the original network uniformly. But what best? What can be best, better than, sorry, what can be better than having the exact network? So if you have the weights of the network, you have a zero error, but zero error in every input and output. Right? It's an L infinity thing. It's not an L2 thing. Right? You with me? In this case, it's coming from a network, yes. But somehow, if you aim at an L infinity thing, rather than minimizing an L2 error, a least to square error, you are doing something else that is trying to identify the right weights. And you want to have some stability about that, right? Yeah, sure. As I said, the result is going to be stable, which means that if you perturb the input and output, you are going to perturb a little bit the weights. You with me? So the, the result has these stability properties that you want to have. OK. OK. So um, now I show you some very specific entangled weights matrices that are of this kind a little bit more specific, OK? And uh, it turns out that these particular weights, matrices, may depend on the input x. So I have many possible entangled weights, matrices, depending on the input x, many of them. How do I get them? Well, the way I get them is by computing the Hessian of the network. So assume that the network has multiple output components, F1, F, L, I don't know, ML, sorry, OK? And I take the Hessian of it. It turns out that the Hessian is decomposed in, in a, it has a certain decomposition in rank one matrices. And these components of these rank one decompositions are the columns of these VL matrices up here. So if you want, where these weights all orthogonal 
or actually also normal, then this would be a sort of singular value decomposition of the Hessian of the network. Okay? You with me? The so it would be easy. I would take the network. I compute finite differences of the network on a finite number of points. I compute the Hessian of the network. And I take the singular value decomposition. And the singular values are the columns of my, uh, the singular vectors are the columns of my, of my entangled weights matrices. Trouble is that in general, the weights are non-orthogonal, non OK? And so the question is, what can we do with this? Yes? You with me? Filippo. Ernesto. OK. But still, you see that for every input, I have here these matrices that I don't know how to extract out of this. But they are there. OK? And now comes the observation that the map mapping x into the entangled weight matrices, so these particular entangled weight matrices, is Lipschitz continuous. OK? What does it mean? It means that if I sample Hessians from a distribution of inputs that are tightly concentrated around some x star, what you can expect is that the Hessians themselves, they come as linear combinations of rank one matrices. And all these rank one matrices are concentrated around a very specific uh, rank one vectors. And these rank one vectors are the entangled weights evaluated in X star. So basically, you have this span of these guys that constitute a linear space of matrices. And the Hessians are all concentrated around non-linear, non-convex cones around this very nice subspace. It's some point. It's a generic point. There is the Hessian evaluated exactly on that point that is lying on that subspace. And all the others, they will be around it. Not on it, but they will be around it. You with me? Yeah, so if the distribution is tightly concentrated around the X, OK, so which means that you sample points, X po points in RD. You sample them very nicely close to X star like a Gaussian around it, OK? The geometry of the Hessians will be this one. So they will be very closely uh, around this subspace. Do you understand the geometry? Is it clear? You with me? So they are not distributed really symmetrically around it. We don't know exactly how. Okay? But they won't be too far from it. And so what do you do? You, first of all, generate a lot of them by using finite differences. You basically sample the function in order to create finite differences. And you create the action of the network. And you do it on many points generated according to a tight um, probability distribution. Okay, and, it, and then out of this, you do a PCA. So you try to find the best fitting subspace that fits this cloud of Hessians. Okay, simply you do an, an SVD of these uh, matrices that you made vectors, for instance. You can 
uh, basically create a matrix of these matrices. And then you do the SVD, and you try to find the best fitting subspace. And you call it W hat. And the magic is that this W hat will be very, very close to this guy. Okay? Yes, absolutely. The, the higher the dimension, OK, the question is whether this is really feasible in high dimension. It is feasible in high dimension. And the, the higher is the dimension, the, the tighter is the concentration. OK? OK, so now we learned that <coughs> we are able to, to find an approximation to this space. OK? And we know that these are these particular guys, they may be columns of entangled weights. Are you with me? So we could generate some matrices of this kind with them. OK? Uh, nevertheless, we, we don't have two um, information. We don't have these guys individually. We have only the linear span of them. Okay, And second, we don't know how they are attributed to different layers. We don't know that. We, lo we lose this information. We only know that these are entangled weights, but we don't know whether they belong to the first layer, second layer, third layer. We don't know that. OK. OK. And now comes once more um, some further genericity in the story. The first genericity is, as I said before, some full rankness that uh, we discussed. The second one is that these vectors form a frame that is, uh, is a unit norm frame with an upper constant that is not too far from 1. In other words, these vectors cannot be orthonormal but they are sufficiently well spread. They are a frame, unit norm frame, but sufficiently separated between each other. Okay? Otherwise, if they are too close to each other, they become not distinguishable in a stable way. There is no way you can do that with any algorithm. Okay? So they need to be a little bit incoherent. And this is a one more genericity property that you need. Okay, Filippo? Another thing is that the subspace that we wanted to learn, this one, has been learned in a good way. And that's something that we can obtain with one of our theorems will tell us that we can approximate it nicely. Okay? And we call somehow the deviation from being orthonormal basis, let's say, and uh, from uh, the right approximation, sorry, it, it, from the space, we have two quantities, delta and nu, that are related to the problem and the stability of the problem. And now, what we would like is to find uh, these entangled weights within the subspace that is approximating the right subspace. We want to find those. Okay? And the way to do that is by solving the following optimization problem. So we take a unit, ve a unit vector. We form its one rank matrix. We project it onto the subspace that we computed. And we maximize the Frobenius norm of the result matrix. So we want that this is maximal. Okay? Actually, it is what we would like it is the closest to one possible. Equivalently, you can uh, somehow maximize the operator norm. Okay? You can do the, also that, that one. So, if you, so what you have in your hands is W hat. Okay? And in particular, you have the orthogonal projection onto W hat. And by using that, you can formulate this following optimization. If you do that, you have the following theorem that tells you that if... Uh, close to any of the entangled weights, there will be 
a local maximizer of this problem. Okay. And the second statement is that very close to any of the entangled weights, they will be a local maximizer. Okay. And the other way around is that a local maximizer is always close to one of these entangled weights. So close to an entangled weights, there will be a global, a, a, sorry, there will be always a local maximizer. And close to a local maximizer, there will be always a, an entangled weights. Okay? So if you try to solve this problem, you will get. Uh, and here the error that comes into the game is given by, by the genericity constant and how well you approximated the subspace. Okay, you with me? More or less, this is the um, kind of results that you get. Okay, so now if you, um, I skip a little bit this. If you solve this problem by using a gradient ascent algorithm that is called subspace power method, and uh, there are some results not by us but by other, um, by other colleagues, that shows that these algorithms generically converge to a global maximizer, and nevertheless, it's converged uh, certainly to local, uh, to, to, to steady states in a certain sense, um, then you, you can basically solve this problem generically, okay? If you start from um, a random initial condition, generically it converges to a global maximizer, then then basically you can compute these uh, entangled weights one by one. Now, I don't get into all the details how you attribute weights to, to layers. We don't have a full procedure for very deep networks. We can do that up to um, networks with three layers. Then we have procedures that knows what goes to the first, what goes to the last, and therefore what goes in the middle. We don't know yet how to attribute the entangled weights to deeper networks. So, we, so we, we know how to get them, but we don't know how to attribute correctly them to all the layers, okay? But if you assume that you are able to attribute them correctly and you are left with the residual parameters, then basically you can fit the residual parameters and you get the network completely, okay? So here you can see some phase transition diagrams on the probability of exact uh, reconstruction of the entangled weights. And they can, you can see that in certain regimes, uh, depending on the number of samples, depending on the number of neurons, uh, for some uh, finite number of samples, depending on architecture, you can really have exact reconstruction of the entangled weights and, and so on and so on, okay? So this is uh, basically uh, the conclusion of the first tale it was a long story, but I, I'm open to questions. I Well, we are happy uh, to compute a local maximizer. The algorithm is guaranteed to compute a, uh, a global maximizer. Yeah. Well, the, the algorithm the algorithm can do better than just computing a local maximizer. But for the theory, it's sufficient. Sure. Yeah, because any global maximizer will be close to one of the uh, of the weights, okay. for sure. So then you don't miss uh, any because since you if I understood correctly, you relate uh, uh, this uh, entangled weight with local maximizer or global. So let me see. Uh, Right, but see, that's true, but uh, somehow 
for, for, for each of them, there is a local maximizer that is close to them, okay? And this local maximizer has to be having a, a, a value of the cost that is very, very high. So it's morally a global maximizer, essentially, at least uh, from this condition here, okay? And uh, I think that is more, yeah, it is, uh, this part of the, of the statement is about local, but this is also saying the other way around, that any local maximizer will have a, um, a entangled weights close to it. So I agree with you that this is about the local maximizer, not necessarily global. But what you know is that the local maximizer that you compute is nevertheless uh, a very uh, a, a one that has a very uh, high value of the of the cost. So uh, you, I agree with you. So. Ascent, yeah. Yeah, but the geometry, the geometry looks like this. So let me let me show you. So you have, okay. I can. So the geometry. If this is the sphere, okay, and this is the cost function that you are trying to. Uh, optimize, the shape is like that. And so this is W1, this is W2, this is W3, and so on. And so uh, if you start here, you generically get there. This is the shape that you have in mind. It's a non-convex problem, but it's normalized. It made the simple. It's not like minimizing something like that, okay? Yeah, this is one, or one minus delta. Okay? So this is Frobenius norm. Ah, no, sorry, this is the value, yeah. Sorry? Yes, so you have to re reinitialize, and after a certain number of trials, which is, um, say the number of neurons times the logarithm of it, you, you get all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Are there further questions? Okay. So, but from this example, we learned that global optimization. I, I will go further with this second tail. Let's see whether we have time for the third tail. But at least, really, you don't want further tails. It's up to you. I'm, I'm here once. Uh, it's up, up to the time that you have at disposal. So if you say that it's over, that we can stop here, I would say. One more tail. So we learned that non-convex optimization is very important. Uh, say, but long before machine learning, uh, there's been a lot of research done op for optimizing any sort of processes. And instead of using gradient descent, that is the simplest possible algorithm, or Newton method, these are the things that mathematicians are using. The truth is that in uh, in, uh, in the practice, engineers have been using completely different um, type of optimization methods. They are called metheuristics, and metheuristics are based on um, multiple algorithms that are trying to minimize a certain process, but they basically um, interact with each other, they help each other, and they try to communicate to the other uh, algorithms uh, where is the best possibility of finding the global min minimizer or maximizer? At the same time, they are combining deterministic and, and, and uh, stochastic type of uh, mechanisms. 
These are some of the names of metaheuristics that um, come into the game. Very popular are genetic algorithms or particles worm optimization. Okay. The trouble is that um, these methods are very, very difficult to analyze. So um, they are based on certain kind of intuitions, mechanisms, uh, like uh, genetic or biology type of ideas. But from a mathematical point of view, they are hard to analyze, and it's really difficult to show that there exist uh, uh, guarantees of global convergence. With the intention of trying to find a um, method that could be similar to particles worm optimization, but could be analyzed mathematically, um, Pinot and others, and later with the help of Jose Antonio Carrillo and, and collaborators, they um, introduced what they call consensus-based optimization, which is a derivative-free method based on instantaneous stochastic and deterministic decisions that try to find a consensus among particles on the position of a global uh, minimizer. The interesting thing is that due to the instantaneous stochastic properties, they can, their dynamics can be described as a system of stochastic differential equations that was low is expected to converge to the solution of a PDE as soon as the number of particles goes to infinity. So if you have a very, very large amount of particles, you expect that the law of the system actually can be described by a evolution PDE. And then what you do, you try to analyze the large time behavior of the solution of the PDE to prove that it's converging to a delta Dirac in the global optimization, in the global uh, optimizer. Okay? So basically you have three levels of approximation. The algorithm can be approximated by system of stochastic differential equations. The system of stochastic differential equations when the n number of particles is very large can be described by the PDE. And the large time behavior of the PDE describes the global maximizer. Okay? That's a bit the idea. That's how it works. Particles are over there. Zillions of local minimizers. But after a few seconds, everybody learn that the global maximizer is over there. Okay? No more mystery. Where is the global maximizer? Okay? And as you see, there is a, in a, in a certain sense, a, a combination of a stochastic process together with the consensus type of dynamics. Okay? That's how it works. Okay, so now, uh, here we, we have, if these are the particles that I call VI, and they describe the position of the particles, you can synthesize the so-called atomic uh, measure that, or the empirical measure of these particles. And you call V star the global minimizer of the function that you want to optimize that we call E. And then, the algorithm is basically described by an evolution of the position of the particles according to this uh, discrete time evolution where you have a term where the particles are drifted towards, they, they fill a pool towards the direction of a consensus point. The consensus point is a barycenter of the particles where the mass of the particle is inverse proportional in exponential way in terms of the function that you want to optimize. So the particle that is a smaller value of E is the larger particle. And the particles that have a very large value of E, they have very thin mass. They count less. And you, what you find is a sort of center of mass. Okay of them, and then this instantaneous center of mass is a sort of consensus points where every particle is pulled to. 
At the same time, as long as particles are not in the consensus point, they are far away, they have additionally a noise, a sort of Brownian motion. And is the, the further a particle is from the consensus point, the wilder the particle is exploring. And so this is term is an exploration term that vanishes as soon as all the particles agree that this is the right uh, point. You with me? OK. The magic is the following. Now, let's fix three points that are, say, the beginning of the stochastic process for three particles. And we choose other particles at random. And we let the system go. And we keep trace of the trajectories that these t three particles usually do in time. And what you see, they create a cloud of uncertainty of possible trajectories. But if you take the average trajectory about all the trajectories that these particles would have done, you get straight lines to the global maximizer. OK? In other words, these particles converge directly in a, a long linear rays to the global maximizer. So what they do, they actually compute morally, on average, the gradient descent of the square distance to the global maximizer. So if you want, you can write it in the, in the following way. So under certain inverse uh, uh, continuity property around the global maximizer, if the number of particles is large enough, on average, the system behave like a gradient flow, gradient flow of this function. OK, so the, that's uh, exactly the point. So what you can see is that when the number of particles is very, very large, OK, this method behave um, as a very simple gradient descent towards is convexifying the problem. The problem becomes super duper beautiful. It's minimizing this function. Whatever non-convex function you started from, eventually the problem becomes a quadratic minimization. So the complexity, the, the hardness of the original optimization problem cannot be at that level. It has to be on the way you converge with the number of particles to do, to, towards this situation, right? Well, there we do have certain uh, results on compact manifolds. On compact manifolds, you can prove that you converge like n to the minus 1 with an exponent that does not depend on the dimension. But you have a constant in front of that that may depend on the dimension. On the sphere, we prove that that depends linearly on the dimension for certain kind of problems. But in general, uh, we do expect that either the constant or the exponent may depend on the dimension depending on whether the problem is, is um, uh, uh, the hardness of the, of the problem is de uh, dimension dependent. OK? So you cannot get rid. I mean, with this magic, you cannot get rid of the dimensionality if the problem originally is um, uh, intractable because of the dimensionality. I mean, otherwise you are able to solve uh, uh, NP problems with a polynomial algorithm, right? So that, that won't be possible. OK? OK, so I don't get into these details, given the fact that the time is, is, um, is uh, uh, short. But uh, somehow, um, I, can, I can show you that the, uh, this kind of mechanics and, and, and principle can be brought to um, minimize non-convex functions over non-convex structures. So here you have, um, for instance, a minimization of functions over a torus. Okay where you have also a, um, a curvature 
uh, change. So this is a very, quite complex structure, and still somehow you're able to, to minimize correctly, uh, to converge correctly to the global uh, minimizer. Uh, we have results on the sphere uh, that are also related to very nasty functions like the rastreging functions. And you can use these methods also to solve um, uh, uh, machine learning problems. They have been used for training neural networks. We have been using that for solving phase retrieval problem. You can use them for subspace detection problems. So it's, it's a method that has some global guarantees that other methods won't have. Okay, um, but of course the cost is a number of particles that has to be large enough. For problems in dimension 3000, you might uh, need something like 200 particles uh, depending on the, on the problem, okay? But we, we do have problems that scale okay with the dimension. So they, they won't necessarily be bad with the dimension, yeah. Okay, I would say that um, Let's conclude by, by this, right? So without, uh, without stressing too much all the details, but um, somehow the idea for these problems is to have a, an error estimate that depends on three, three parts. One part is the discretization error in time. So then there is the error due to the number of particles. And what you want is typically a narrow that do not depend necessarily in a bad way with the dimension, and then some, some epsilon error that comes from the so-called Laplace principle, but that's something that I was not able to, to introduce you uh, properly. But somehow this is a, an interesting uh, uh, topic that, uh, uh, on which I, I, uh, I worked quite a lot, and if you're interested to try out this kind of optimization methods on your machine learning problems or your uh, non-convex uh, problems that comes from your uh, type of studies uh, would, would be, be interesting for us to know whether they work or not. Yeah. Okay, so other questions maybe about this topic? Yes, locally, locally. So you need, you, you need that in the near of the global maximizer. Yeah, she, she asked uh, whether this condition that is on, on now on the screen, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's important. And they said that it's very, very important because the method is based on the, on the level sets. And so you, you want that the level set of the function tells you how far you are from a global maximizer or minimizer, sorry, global minimizer. And I, what I mentioned is that, yes, it is important, and it is important that it holds locally. It doesn't, doesn't need to, to hold globally. Sorry? Yes? If you don't have other local uh, minimizer in the near, right? So would you, would you be able to solve this problem with a first order method? I'm not completely sure. I mean. No, first order methods, I mean, you have to be lucky. No, no, you want to have a global convergence. So you want. What I'm saying, you want to have a global convergence to a global minimizer. Yeah. Okay. okay. So which is a very strong thing, right? So you are very, very far away. Still, you want to converge to the global maximizer.